Thank you for joining us for this episode of Take Notice, Amplifying Black Stories. I am your host, Allison Preisinger Higgins. Take Notice, Amplifying Black Stories is a podcast exploring society, culture, and current events through conversation. We aspire to create an open, respectful, and equitable space where guests may feel free to share their truth and lived experiences. Our core values are rooted in community, connection, and personal development. Stories help us learn, relate, and grow. We are here to listen, to take notice. Thank you for being with us. I would like to acknowledge the land on which this episode was created. I would like to show gratitude to the traditional ancestral land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present, recognizing that these names are not the original names of the people of these areas. I encourage listeners to research the land on which you live and are listening right now. Recognizing this is just the beginning. The more you explore, challenge, and learn, the more questions may arise, but this is how we grow and connect. In this episode, I connected with Pamela McCoy, a purpose-driven credit industry professional with a career that spans over 25 years. Pamela shares her story of growing up in a military family, her connection with her husband who also served in the military, a life-changing car accident while she was in college, and her passion to serve in many areas of the community. In recent years, she has launched both Bonafide Credit Consultants, LLC, to provide tools needed to fuel financial potential, and B5 Reaffirm to provide a behavior modification tool designed to help females shift their mindset and transform their negative thought process into powerful positive self-talk. Pamela shares more about both businesses in our conversation. So thank you for joining us and please enjoy this episode with Pamela McCoy. Thanks for joining me on Take Notice, Pamela. You are over on the East Coast. I don't think I asked you before we started where on the East Coast you are. I'm in Tampa, Florida, sunny Tampa. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yes. And we have a beautiful day today. It, the humidity is probably that. Nice. I haven't been outside yet, but, but the wind is blowing a little bit, but we're probably in the 80s. Oh, the sun wow. is shining bright, that little breeze. So I know it's perfect out there. So I'm gonna have to go partake in that yes. before the sun yes. goes down. How long have you been in that area? Um, For a total of probably like, oh gosh, 20 years total. Off and okay. off. My husband was active duty military. Oh, and okay. so we were gone for like three and a half years up in Texas. And then we retired here. So we've been back this last time since 07. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've probably been to to many areas then with him mm-hmm. being in the military. What where yeah. else have you have you all lived? Oh gosh. And so well the story of my life is my dad too is active duty Air Force. Oh, so my okay. dad did okay. twenty eight. Then both of my brothers are academy grads. And then I married military. So Air Force is kind of all I know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so my husband's retired now. But yeah, so I've been to um Virginia, Georgia. Uh, it's been overseas. I've not lived overseas, but I've gotten to visit a lot of places overseas. I've been to Germany and Paris and Amsterdam and Turkey. And so there's some place I left off that mm-hmm. I've been overseas, but in the US, like Virginia, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, North Dakota. <laughs> so oh, the wow. list is, yeah. is long. Mm-hmm. So, but I've enjoyed it. And I guess I, I can't say I didn't enjoy it because I don't know the other side of like growing up in the same place. Sure. I think that there's some pros and cons to both lifestyles. You know, those kids who say, oh, I graduated with the same kids I went to kindergarten with. Right. That's not my life. But I think that's kind of cool to, mm-hmm. you know, to to have had these friends and you have grown through life together with this group of people kind of thing. But on the flip side, I got to experience different cultures and ethnicities and diversity and adapting and making new friends and that kind of thing, which you don't really have to do if you have the same group of friends from kindergarten to high school. Right. Yeah. Kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is pros and cons to both lifestyles. Yeah, definitely. Was there one area when you were growing up that you stayed in the for the longest that you would call home or? Um, we call North Carolina home, but okay. not necessarily because we spent the more time there. I guess ultimately we ended up spending more time there, but both my parents had attachments to North Carolina. And so when my father retired from the military, he retired in North Carolina. And oh. so I actually ended up graduating from high school there. And I went to college. I went to NC State and got my business degree. 
Okay. In there. So we call North Carolina home. So you're surrounded by your parents and siblings, your two brothers growing up or two brothers and a sister and a sister. Wonderful. Yeah. And so they are all like a year apart, three years and then me. Oh, okay. So you're the youngest. <laughs> I'm the youngest. Yes. And I'm glad you said the youngest and not the baby. Cause you know, I get that a lot. Oh, you're the baby. Well, I'm an awfully big baby. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, I'm the I'm the youngest as well. So maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, we just get used to it, right? Yeah, yeah. You just uh, shrug it off. Like, sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So your dad was in the military Air Force. Mm-hmm. What uh, what job? Do you remember what job he had? What? His MOS, he was what people call police, military police. So MPs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he was that. And then like when he retired from the military, he actually went, stayed in law enforcement. So he was a correctional officer for the state. Oh, okay. But in between that, he also got his real estate license. So he was doing that on the oh. side. Uh-huh. And um, so when he retired from the state, he went to work for the city again in law enforcement. <laughs> and and so he just has a heart for that. And it's so funny. I tell the story about my dad. When he was working for the city, he got involved in this program, a deferment program for youth that would get in trouble. And so in, as opposed to giving them a record, et cetera, they could go to this deferment program. And so he was involved in that, you know, these kids helping them with schoolwork and in that kind of thing, really just pouring into them. And mm-hmm. uh, so when he was ready to retire from there, They came back to me and said to maintain his certification to participate in that program. He had to work two days a year. (laughs) So my dad was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and knock these two. So I'm going to work my two days back to back and go ahead and get that out the way. Like, Oh, two days. (laughs) Two days. 365, you're going to work two days out of the year to stay certified. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to be like you when I grow up, right? Yeah. (laughs) Working two days out of the year, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and knock those out, put those back to back and, you know, get that behind me, you That's know, great. That's fine. but I remember when he retired the first time he even like the day after retirement, I call him like, dad, so what are you doing today? He said, absolutely nothing. I didn't even go check the mailbox today because it felt too much like work. <laughs> 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 was like, yeah, this is my idol. This guy right here, I'm gonna be there just you like go. you when I grow up. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. What did your mom do? Did she stay at home? Well, my or? mom, she didn't have what we would consider like a career job per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad was kind of old school and, you know, the, the man of the household, he's the provider, that kind of thing. And so my mother mm-hmm. had options. He was like, you know, you can work if you want or not if you don't want. Right. And so she worked periodically. She did get, have her cosmetology license. She did hair. Um, okay. She was a seamstress. Oh my gosh. She, my mother could like see you walking in the mall with a suit on and come home and cut a pattern out of newspaper and wear that same suit to church on Sunday. Like she just wow. was artsy and creative and from sewing to crocheting and knitting and macrame and cooking, like she just did and could do all of those. I got little pieces of those jeans. My sister got more of those jeans than I did. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, my mom was very, and so she worked off and on, but her main focus was her kids. So she raised us four kids and raised some other kids. Like she was like that mom, like everybody wanted her to be their mom (laughs) kind of thing. She was like this neighborhood mom. So there was always extra kids like at the dinner table or stuff, (laughs) you know, kind of thing. But yeah, so she worked off and on and Mm -hmm. really entrepreneurial because like she would do things like prom season, she's making prom dresses and and that kind of thing. But back then they didn't really call it like entrepreneurship, right? It's just kind of, this is what she did. (laughs) But it really was entrepreneurial that she would, you know, people would want her to bake cakes for their events um, and that kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. I guess that's probably where I got that entrepreneurial spirit was yeah, from my mom, yeah. even though it wasn't technically called that at the time. Right. Yeah. Different, different mindset at the time, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's just what you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's wonderful. And, and kind of in a way kind of open because if she's not making, going down the road of making a, a like a cake business or something, she's doing all mm-hmm. these other things and open to whatever whatever she wants to do or whatever Mm -hmm. she's asked of. That's kind of cool. And, and having really the flexibility in her schedule because her priority was always raising her kids. Mm -hmm. Right. And so she could do these other things and, you know, have that as her priority 
kind yeah. of thing. So it really was a, a, a dynamic that worked, right? My dad's philosophy was, you know, I'm the provider. So you can work if you want, but if you don't want, you know, taking care of the kids is work, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so that's kind of what she did as we got older, then she would work a little more outside of the home. But when we were younger, she pretty much was at home mom and just doing these, what we now call today, like side hustles, right? Where she's sewing mm-hmm. or baking or, or what have you. But it was cool yeah. though to have that because my dad in military, you know, sometimes he'd be TDY, that kind of thing. So she's, you know, the mom's taxi getting kids from point A to point B to all of her extracurricular activities. She's, you know, always in the stands, you know, cheering you on, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. yeah, I wouldn't have traded that. And, and it's, you know, again, when you're in it, you don't really think about it. But as you get grown and you have hindsight, and you have your own kids and all those things, you really see the value and the impact that it had on you to be able to look up in the stand and you see your mom, you know what I mean? Because every kid didn't have that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's like at the time, you're just like, oh, hey, mom, you know, no big deal. Yeah. But in hindsight, like, wow, that was that was powerful that she, you know, put forth the effort and made us that kind of priority because yeah. it it's a choice. And sometimes people don't get to make that choice mm-hmm. kind of thing. So Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sounds like great memories for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And I think all of that, you know, comes together and molds who you are. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That nurturing and, and all of that influences the person that you grew up to be, even if in the time, in the moment, like you're not connecting the dots that, oh, this thing that happened today, that's going to be a value when I'm 25. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Like you don't see that. You're no just way in to this know. Moment, yeah. But then in hindsight, you're like, oh my gosh, like look at this tapestry. Mm-hmm. You know, that was created by, you know, time it, because so often, you know, what I do now today, I, I do a lot of outreach and even in my businesses, a lot of my contracts deal with at-risk youth mm-hmm. and doing that really makes me reflective because I think for a lot of these kids, it is that missing piece of the puzzle that's created their circumstance right? They don't feel heard. They don't feel valued. They don't feel like I'm important. They don't feel like anyone cares about my purpose. I must not have a purpose. You know, all of those kind of things, which are, you know, it's not someone sitting down saying, oh, you know, you are about it, It's actions, right? By people's actions say that you're important. I care about you. I want you to do well. I'm supporting you. I'm encouraging you. I'm inspiring. Like it, it's actions that do that, not Oh, you sit down, you have this conversation, you have it once. And so now your kid is good to go. It's not that. Right. It's this yeah. day in, day out, little bitty things creating, like I said, this tapestry of your value, right? And these mm-hmm. kids that is missing, you know, and so then they are so easily misguided because they're searching for this thing that's missing, but they don't even know what it is that they're looking for, right? Right. Mm Because it's missing. And unfortunately, it's generational. So their parent was missing that piece. Right. So they can't say, oh, here's the missing puzzle piece or what have you. Or I'm going to provide that missing piece for my kid because all you know is something is missing. Something there's a disconnect and you don't know what it is. And you're just going through life and then you have a kid and then they have this piece that's missing. But no one knows how to call a thing a thing. And so it's just they continue on. And so as I'm working with them, I, I, I reflect back, you know, as some of the kids are sharing their stories and you're thinking, oh my gosh, how horrific this story. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, when I was your age, I was like one step away from playing with baby dolls. Like, you know, my life seemed so simple. Oh, you thought then, oh, my parents are the worst. They want well, other kids are going to do this. And my parents say no. <laughs> right. And so you're angry in that moment because other, but then in hindsight, like, oh my gosh, what they saved me from. Right. I'm so yeah. glad they said no, because now you can see in your adult life like, oh, yeah, that was a good no. <laughs> right. <laughs> and if they had said yes, I could have ended up on the other side. Right. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. But th- these kids, some of them, they're so, so lost mm. and they don't know how to be found because mm. they don't know that they're lost, really. If right. that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. And so it's, it's very rewarding work to, to be able to work with them and show them the other side of really just simply caring, 
right? Mm-hmm. No strings attached. I just care about your well being and I want you to do well and be well, right? Or when they talk, like you just listen, like I hear you and, and I see you because I think that's the biggest piece. Like they don't feel like you, you see over me, through me, around me, but you don't see me and I'm standing right here. You don't see me. I need you to see me, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so to be able to see them gives them that piece of hope of, oh, that's probably the missing piece. Someone really heard me that like they really listened to what I had to say. And it's not even about agreeing or disagreeing. It's just that you listened mm-hmm. and you let me say what I wanted to say. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to do that. And, and then you run into these kids some point in the future and they are so forever grateful for that moment in time and mm-hmm. how it shifted things for them. You know, in that moment, you know, they were on this path of negativity and bad things. But just in that moment, like, wow, like, yeah, I need to do different. And then they start to do different and and they can associate it with that specific moment in time in their life Mm. kind of thing. And so it's very rewarding to do that. I imagine. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about how you got to being able to do that outreach. But before we do that, I would love to hear. So you said you went to NC State and you got your Mm -hmm. business degree. Where, where did you go after college? And so my first job out of college was this management training program through Sears. And I did their credit. Mm -hmm. They had retail and credit. I was on the credit side. And at that time, it was a very prestigious assignment, you know, cutthroat, like it's the competition to get in, you know, so it was really hard to make the cut and you get in. And I was so excited. And that program lasted like 18 months, like it was very in-depth program. And what it did industry-wide was position you because it was like the holy grail, if you will. Like if you got in and graduated from this program, the industry knew that you knew your stuff. Mm -hmm. because they knew that the program was very intensive and everybody didn't get in and everybody didn't complete it. Right. And so if you completed the program and they see that on your resume, that immediately opened doors simply because you completed the program kind of thing. So that was exciting. So I was with Sears on their credit side for just shy of 10 years, I guess it was. And um, then I switched over to private label. So I was at a bank from there. I went to, no, I take that back. I went to service merchandise which doesn't Mm. even exist. So you're probably too young to even know about service merchandise. But anyway, (laughs) it was a retailer. And it was kind of cool because when you go in the store, they would like have like one item of the item on display. And they had these little white cards, right? Like Um. that had the the scan codes. So you would go through and you pick up the cards of the items that you wanted to purchase. And then so you go back to customer service and they scan your little cards. And then they had this conveyor belt and you see your stuff coming down on the conveyor belt kind of thing. Yeah, it was the coolest thing. So it wasn't like they had, oh, 10 of these items and you pull one off the shelf. It wasn't that. They would have one of the item. So like back in the warehouse or something. Mm Oh, interesting. So that was long before your time. But anyway, so I worked for service (laughs) merchandise, not in the retail side. I was on the credit side there too. So I was at their headquarters in Tennessee. And um, so I did that for a year. And um, then I switched over to banking on the bank card side. And because at that time in that transitioning, I was dating and I got engaged and I was about to get married. My husband was actually doing the military, right? And so we were pivoting and shifting and commuting. Me and my husband, another interesting fact, we were together. We dated three and a half years before we got married. We were 10 years in before we actually lived under the same roof. Oh, wow. Because we both, he was actually doing the military. So he might have yeah. to, you know, get transferred here. And I was doing this in my, my career or what have you. So we were like telecommuting <laughs> and all of wow. that for like 10 years um, before we actually lived under the same roof. Hmm. or what have you. So I, I was at service merchandise and I went to banking, which brought me to Tampa. And here's where I met my husband is in Tampa. Then I was at that bank for 15 years. And while I was at the bank, I started my first business, Bonafide Credit Consultants, LLC. I started that back in 2008. I was still full-time at the bank, vice president, and um, just, so just kind of doing it on the side and you know, oh, okay. and all yeah. of that. And then 2013, I left corporate altogether and was doing entrepreneur full-time. 
And then in June of 2020, amidst the pandemic, I got an assignment from the big guy, as I call it, because who else launches a business amidst the pandemic unless it's an assignment, <laughs> right? Um, and so B5 Reaffirm, another division of my company, was birthed amidst the pandemic. Mm. And it has been an amazing journey. Wow. An yeah. Amazing journey. And so you were doing five years of uh, stuff on the side while you were still like a VP of a, of a bank. Is that correct? Yeah. And I felt like, you know, the bank was getting all of me and Bonafide was getting the leftovers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Makes That's sense, a lot. Right? So my company was just kind of getting the leftovers and, and, uh-huh. and I was contemplating the, the transition, right? Because I, I really, Bonafide was what fulfilled me what fueled me. Right. And so I enjoyed the bank and all that, you know, steady income, all that kind of stuff. So it had benefits too, Mm -hmm. but bona fide was passion for me. And my purpose was being fulfilled through bona fide. And so when I felt like it's just getting the leftovers, like that short changing my purpose, Mm -hmm. And so I had to make that shift. And of course, as I'm contemplating my shift, you know, like the big guy steps in and just like pushes it all over. This is what it's going to (laughs) be. While you sitting there contemplating and thinking it through, this is what I said you're going to do. So this this is what's going to (laughs) happen. So get off the fence. And so he did push me right off the fence, right? No more Humpty Dumpty Mm -hmm. sitting on the wall. Like, you know, (laughs) this is the decision, right? And so I have been entrepreneuring ever since, but I would be remiss if I were to say that I could do this journey without the support of my husband, who I refer to lovingly as my heartbeat, um, mm. without him, without his support, like I couldn't, you know, mm-hmm. um, he, he's just there, my number one cheerleader, you know, um, about walking in my purpose and fueling that passion of the purpose and impacting the lives of the people that I'm blessed to serve and, and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. And he too has a heart to serve. So we're, we do a lot of outreach in the community, dealing with the homeless population in mm. those mm-hmm. most adversely affected by the various disparities, whether it's economic, whether it's medical, um, housing, all of that, um, to be yeah. able to to serve, um, because it is our belief that too much is given, much is required, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and we truly have been blessed in more ways than one can even begin to count. And as I say, when I'm teaching, you know, no one is perfect and no one's life is perfect, but, you know, too much is given, much is required. And, yeah. and so, you know, we're, we're not put here as an island, as an, in, an individual or one person. We're here. Human nature says that we have to nurture, right? We all want to feel loved and like you belonged and you're important and, and all of that. That's just ingrained. That's a human being, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what makes you a human being is having those feelings, having those needs or what have you. And so to be able to to give those gifts to another human being who may have never known it or has lost their way and have forgotten it or, or what have you. So in some cases, teach in other cases, gently remind people mm-hmm. of their value and their worth. You know, that's the God's greatest gift. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. What uh, was the initial inspiration of branching out on your own? Can you think of of that? <sighs> well, you know, like I said, my, my background has been in credit, credit cards and banking, my whole professional mm-hmm. career over almost a 30 year span. I'll never forget. It was probably late 2006, 2007 time frame. People knew what I did professionally. I'm the vice president. I was under my purview, I had collections, recovery, fraud, and probate, right? Mm. All what people refer to as the back end of the business. So when people would have people that we know at our church and our family, or whatever, would have problems with their credit, their credit bureau, their credit scores, a creditor or whatever, they're always like, oh, you know, help me. What do I need to do? Da, da, da. And of course, I help people out or, or what have you. And people would always say like, oh my gosh, like you need to do this for a business. Like people need what you do. People need to hear, you know, and it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Like I know there's other people that do it, but the way you help us understand and, and you know, keep mm-hmm. it plain and, and all of that kind of, you really need to do something with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. You know, and I just keep helping people. And then fast forward to 2007, 
our pastor at church preached a whole series <laughs> on walking in your purpose. Oh, right. Sure. And it was like everywhere you turn, you're like getting convicted. Like, oh my God, it's like <laughs> everywhere we, we go out of town and we visit a church and it seems like that pastor would be something along the lines of purpose and, and all of that. And I'm like, all right. Like I acquiesced up the white, you know, <laughs> the white flag. I give up, I give up, I give up. So really it was just a culmination of people planting that seed, if you will, and mm-hmm. different people, people that I knew well, people that I just met for the first time, you know, people I didn't know, like, you know, it, it just was coming in all directions and all directions. And so it was through that. And then my pastor preaching that series was just the confirmation that this is what I'm supposed to do. And so bona fide credit consultants, LLC was birthed out of that. So I launched that April 2nd, 2008. We officially launched and we went through this whole, my husband and I, this whole series of like, how, what what is it going to be called? What's my company being called? You know, our last name is McCoy. So the whole, the real McCoy, all that kind of, and nothing Mm -hmm. really resonated. Right. And then I thought, um, well, what do I want my company to stand for? And because there's other people certainly that do what I do. Right. But I'm a proponent of no one can do it like you, but you, because there's only one of you. Right. (laughs) And Mm so I thought, well, I want to be genuine, right? Because some of the people that do what I do, honestly, they're they're money driven and it's really not about the people. It's about the money. The advice is just whatever feels good, sounds good. That's what I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. That's not who I am. And so genuine was the first that came to mind. I thought, oh, wow, well, genuine, but that doesn't, I couldn't get anything buzz, like, (laughs) you know, thinking marketing and all this kind of stuff. And my husband already had personalized plates at that time. We'd gone through gyrations of that, but his license plate was justified. J-U-S-T-A, the number five D, justified, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that popped into my mind and I thought, you know, what's something else that means genuine? And of course, bona fide means genuine and honest intent, integrity, all of that. And so bona fide is spelled B-O-N-A-F-I-D-E. Of course, that doesn't fit on a license plate. <laughs> and so I thought about my husband's license plate. So that is now my license plate is bona fide. B-O-N-A, the number five D is my mm, license yeah. plate. And so now when we park next to it, we're justified and bona fide. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> and so that's kind of the short story of how bona fide the name came. And it's spelled different because, of course, it, it, matched his license plate and all of that. And it, you know, had a nice little ring to it and a buzz. I had all kinds of marketing ideas that came to mind around Bonafide and all of that. And so then fast forward to 2013, when I left banking, I won't tell the whole story because that's going to be in my book that I'm writing. I'm, I've got three books out already. So I'm in the process of writing like two at the same time <laughs> now. Oh, great. But one of them great. is going to be about my B5 reaffirm journey, which we'll talk about in a bit. But we had an encounter, which I say was truly an encounter by God here on earth. Like his presence was, it was amazing. And it was in that encounter with this individual that the clarity came around bona fide and justified, right? You know, my husband's license plate is justified and, and mine is bona fide. And, and this person was saying, you know, tying it back to scripture or whatever, which came first and, you know, all of that. And scripturally, you have to be justified before you can be bona fide. That's mm. what's in the word. Right. Mm. And um, so that whole emotional story and that, that encounter, the, the, the meaning and the purpose just shifted, right? Like we were thinking, oh, it's just a vanity plate, but it's not. It's so much deeper than that. Mm. And at the time we didn't know it, but of course he's orchestrating everything. So he knew in the very beginning when he gave us that idea, (laughs) right? That that there's this story that will unfold in in time, but I'm bona fide. And the five is significant because you'll note a first company that I have is bona fide. My second company is B5 Reaffirm. The motto of bona fide is E5, to educate, empower, evolve, enlighten, and enrich when you apply those principles, financial freedoms right in the palm of your hand. Mm. The workshops that I do are F5, either fueling financial fire for families, fueling financial fire for females, or fueling financial fire for fellas, right? Nice. And then there's B5, Reaffirm in B5. And the common denominator in all of them is the number five. Mm-hmm. And the reason why five is biblically speaking, five is the number of grace. Oh, okay. 
and everything is all about his grace, hmm. his grace, his mercy. Like we, we, we are blessed to have his grace every day. Right. And, and so all that I do is really fundamentally around that, that people hmm. can see his grace, that people can then get an understanding of his grace and then be able to offer grace to others and be willing to accept grace when it's given to them. And understanding that sometimes you have to give yourself grace, mm. right? In this whole forgiveness process and, and all of that. And so subliminally, that's why five is fundamental in all that I do, because it's all really about his grace. Wow. That's, that's amazing how impactful even just that piece of your business is and, mm-hmm. and how powerful that is. That's wonderful. Yeah. What a great, great uh, story as, as far as how that all came about and just kind of gradually. It just Yeah, it's like moves. unfolding as life does, right? Because yeah. that's just how he operates, right? Right. I, I mm-hmm. guess because we're all like little babes, if you will, on drinking a bottle. Like a baby can't eat steak and potatoes, not yet, right? They got to graduate right. to that. Yeah. And so he you know, starts to unveil things over time when you're best position to really understand and appreciate the meaning kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you just have to be open and obedient. Thus, when B5 Reaffirm was birthed, it's like, you know, I wasn't like seeking, oh, you know, I need a new division of my company. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't that. Yeah. (laughs) It just, it came to me. And so I do, I refer to the B5 Reaffirm side of my business as my assignment from the big guy. It, it was, it, it's not me at all. Like it is all him. Like, boom, it came to me. It was revealed to me. And this is how it's going to be, how, how to roll it out. Like everything was spelled out because like people even asked me, well, why do you just focus on self-esteem of females in that division? Well, because that's what my assignment was, was females. <laughs> at, at some point I, I will, will envelope in a male mirror program. But for now, it is strictly females because that was the assignment. And you do the assignment and you do it well, right? And then you add to it. You don't just throw all the stuff in there and then nothing's working and you know it looks sure. like a hot mess because he doesn't operate in confusion. And, and so I'm focusing on what I was given to focus on and the rest will come. But it has been this amazing journey. Um, when I launched B5 Reaffirm, you know, like everything else I do in my life, personally and professionally, if people ask me in a word why, it is impact. And mm. what I mean by impact, I want anyone's life who I am blessed to our paths cross, no matter how long, it could be a quick hello to a stranger. It could be an in-depth conversation. They could attend one of my workshops or seminars. They could read one of my books. They can call me on the phone. Whatever the intersection, I need their life to be better in some way. Because of that, mm. because of that intersection, right? So impact, and so when when B five reaffirm was launched, no different. I wanted to have impact on the females that I was blessed to serve. But what I didn't know, but of course he clearly knew because he gave me the assignment. The implementation of this assignment literally, literally has saved the lives of some females. Mm. That was beyond wow. my scope. When I think about it, it, just blows my mind to think that. Because I was obedient to an assignment, someone is still here on this earth breathing because I accepted an assignment. Wow. Um, that that is just so powerful to know, to think like, wow, <laughs> yeah. who would have thought, right? But then when you think about it in retrospect, though, when you get an assignment or you've been through a test and now it's a testimony it's never for you or about you. It's always for someone else, mm-hmm. right? And that's why when, when we when we have these situations and when we come out on the other side or when we're going through, it's so important to, to talk about and share when you're at that place. I mean, when it's raw, sometimes it's harder for people, but it's important to share. And, and sharing is a relative term. Sharing doesn't mean, you know, on a big stage for 5 million people, sharing could be a one-on-one kind of situation, right? Mm-hmm. It's not, it has to be this or that. It could be either or, right? But Mm -hmm. sharing because your story, your test, your testimony or your path to what you hope to be a testimony can speak to someone and help them in their situation or circumstance because really it's never for you 
or about you. It's always for and about someone else. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. And so to, to be able to like, wow, because I did this and something like someone is still here that every time I say it out loud, like it just blows my mind every single time. But then mm. I think back to, you know, people say, well, well, how or why this? Like, I don't even know. Like it was my assignment. But then when I really sit back and I reflect back my freshman year in college, right after Christmas break, I was home for Christmas. Great time. Load up your car, you head out. And, you know, where we live in Goldsboro, it's only like an hour, hour and a half to Raleigh, which is where NC State is. So it was a Saturday. It was not even noon. It had been raining all morning, but it wasn't raining at that moment when I left. And and less than five miles, less than five miles from my parents' house. Bam. Just like that. My life Hmm. changed forever. I got hit hit on by a drunk driver. Oh, wow. On a Sunday. On a Sunday before noon. Wow. Yeah. And so that whole journey of recovery Right. Mm. I ended up having to sit out of school a semester in the summer. Oh, wow. So I was on the five year plan <laughs> for graduation. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm here. Yeah. Right. And, and as horrific as the accident was, as horrific as my journey of recovery was, it wasn't for me or about me. Mm. Right. It was for and about someone else. And, and so I say now it is clarity because. That had to happen for B5 reaffirmed to happen June of 2020, Mm. because now I can speak in first person. I can share my story about self-esteem, right? Mm -hmm. And and how to overcome and and what's required and what it looks like when you're on the other side and, and all of that, not telling people what I heard or what I read, but tell them what I know, Mm -hmm. Right. Because my scar from the accident, I have a scar all the way across my face. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Wow. Permanent. Like it's not going to go away. It doesn't going to fade. It mm. goes from my eyebrow all the way across here because my nose was open like a book. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. On this video, I can't, I can't even. Yeah. And people say, they get, it, you know, but, and, and it's yeah. even that is, is like a blessing because that speaks to his grace. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. Surgeon had to put my face back together, all of that. You know, as an mm-hmm. African American, we have this thing called keloiding, and, and you don't know if you're going to keloid or not until you do or you don't, right? And so, mm. one of my thoughts or fears was that my scar is going to keloid in the center of my face. And a keloid is just like where your scar becomes raised. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And it's very prevalent. Other ethnicities have it too, but in the African American culture, it is it's very prevalent. Um, I see. Okay. Or what have you. Like sometimes if people keloid, if you get your ears pierced, you might've seen where they have that bubble behind their ear Oh, it's like okay. skin or, or whatever. And I don't even know what causes them or whatever, but something, yeah, you know, right. whatever in our makeup. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the fact that that didn't happen, like, so you have to, to find ways to see the glasses half full and count the blessings. There were people who had accidents were, that were much less impactful than mine. They're not here. I got yeah. hit head on by a drunk driver, my car balled up like a piece of paper, but I'm still here. Wow. Wow. Right. And it's like, so why? He obviously had work for me to do. There was something that I had not completed yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because some people have a fender bender and they die. Right. You you know, so, you know, just seeing the, the blessings in even that horrific situation, you, you know, I didn't graduate on time. Like now I'm on the five year plan. So some of the people I started school with, you know, they graduated before me, of course, because they were in school when I was sitting out that semester in the summer. But I don't know if I had a graduated on time, what would have been different in my life? I don't know. Cause you can't unring the bell. You can't unspill the milk. So I don't know. So you just have to say this day forward, you know, mm-hmm. it could have been better. It could have been worse. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. But this is my life. So you got to work with what you have. Right. So, yeah, so yeah. what it took me five years to get out of college where it took some people four. Mm-hmm. some people are in college for 10 or 15 years and still don't yes. get a degree. Right? <laughs> and so it's True. all relative. It's all in yeah. how you choose to perceive it and see it and, and all those kind of things. So, and I'm here to tell the story and now I'm here to be able to shift someone else's mindset. Right. Um, in first person 
because of my experience, because I did come out on the other side. And now they can see, you know, some people scar, they're fortunate and their scars are someplace you can hide it. Because that was my thought, like Jesus, like, why couldn't you have scarred up my arm or my leg or something, you know, where mm. I could like cover it up with clothes? Why in the center of my face? Mm. Right. Right. Because there's, it's a powerful message that is in the center of my face. Mm-hmm. Right. And so at the time I didn't see that, but that's the journey. Right. Because in the moment you're just like, oh, my gosh, like I got this in the center of my face. Like yeah. what in the world? Yeah. Y- you know, but wow. his grace. Mm-hmm. His grace. In your B5 portion of your business, and you're speaking of the impact that you've been able to have on some of the women that you've been working with. Is there a, a story that you can share where that connects to how you've been able to bring your own experience to, to one of these women? Yeah. Um, I don't always share my whole story. Just kind of like he, he orchestrates sure. everything. So some, some workshops, I'll share the whole story. Some workshops is a portion of the story. Some workshops, I don't share it at all. Right. It, it just kind of whatever the, the situation is, it's just, it's crazy. Cause I like to feed off the audience. And so what, whatever. Yeah. And so, but the very first one that I did before B5 reaffirm was birthed. Even it started because I had a contract with the nonprofit that brought me in to work with their at-risk girls on self-esteem and leadership. And it was through getting prepared for that, that the concept was birth, right? Like, cause I needed a way to reach the girls so that I could reach the girls. Mm. And in that first grouping that I worked with, I still wasn't thinking of business or anything. And I followed up with the girls after my time with them was I had multiple sessions and time was up and I kept in touch and would go visit them and check on see how they're doing in school and all of that. Thought, oh, well, let me just get a survey, right? And never even thought about, let me get some feedback what they thought about the boxes. All that was really positive. Just filed that away. Still wasn't thinking of business. And so this particular nonprofit, I financially supported them even far beyond before I got the contract because I believe in their mission, right? And so like many other nonprofits around the holidays, you get the donation request letters and they typically will spotlight one of their clients, what brought them there, how the agency's helping them and all of that. So when I was working with these girls, I didn't know any of their backstories. I know they all had a backstory because they're at this agency, right? Mm -hmm. Something brought you here. But I intentionally didn't know because as I say to these at-risk youth when I'm working with them, whether it's in that agency or the detention center or whatever, the reason why you're here isn't important because it won't change why I'm here, right? Because I'm going to be here if you robbed a bank or you stole a cookie. Like it doesn't matter, right, Mm -hmm. why I'm here. And um, so imagine my surprise when I got this donation request letter and the picture was one of my girls, Mm. from the workshop. So I read her backstory and I was flabbergasted. I was devastated because I had no idea what she had been through. And she was only 15. And Mm. when I tell you, she's been through some stuff Mm. at 15. Right. And I thought, wow. So I immediately went back to pull her feedback sheet to see what she said about the program. And what she said about the box was she, what she liked best is that she could depend on it. And depend is a unique adjective that you never hear from this demographic because that's something that they don't have in their purview. And then she said that when she's having a bad day with an exclamation point is when she uses the box the most. Mm. And I thought, wow. So that really kind of moved me and I was all emotional and everything. So a week or two later, I happened to be at the agency and I was speaking with one of the counselors and not about this particular young girl, but just, we were just chit chatting about the program and all that kind of stuff. And she was sharing that this young girl had attempted the ultimate negative act was about Mm. to do that, but the box. Mm. And so now what her words took on an entirely different context. When she said she could depend on it, when Mm. she said when she's having a bad day, that's where she went. When she was having the ultimate bad day, Mm. she went there and it was enough to shift her mindset from what she was about to do. Wow. She's still here today to tell her story. And I thought, wow, in that moment was the shift for me because it's like, wow, I had no idea that level of impact. Right. Right. And the icing on the cake, if there is any, is that this young girl's name is not Pam or Kim or Tammy. Her name is Serenity. Mm. And her life had been anything but peace until the box. 
Wow. So in that box, she found hope. She found a reason to live. She found a reason to be. She found her worth. And I thought in that moment is why B5. That's when it was birth because I knew then there's a lot of serenities in the world, right? Mm -hmm. That this, what I thought was something for this one group of girls, it's so much bigger than that group of girls. It's so much bigger than me. It is universal, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was the impetus of the birth of B5 Reaffirm. Right. Because we all need not only affirmation, but reaffirmation. We all need to know ultimately that it's nice to have a supporting cast, but you can be a star by yourself. Yeah. Right. And so to wow. give females and, and to date, I've served over 500, even just that short window of time. And they range from 12, 13. So what I like to call my sassy seniors in their 70s. <laughs> and everything in between. Um, wow. It has been an amazing, an amazing journey of impact. There's been other life-saving testimonials, but Serenities is always my favorite because it was the first that I was made aware of mm -hmm. or, or what have you. Um, sure. But to, to just be able to give the gift of self to someone, there's no greater gift, right? Because wow. it's not a moment. It, it is for your lifetime. And it then becomes generational because when you feel your value, you show up different in the world. And so now your ripple is different. And mm -hmm. so that's the goal. That is why B5, that, that is why. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with his grace. His grace is sufficient. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. You mentioned in that story, you mentioned the box. And so that must be a part of your program and what you do. Can you describe what that is a little bit? Yeah, it's called the B5 Reaffirmation Box. I know your audience can't see it, but I'll show it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Purple, but everything about the box is intentional, right down to the colors. Purple is my favorite color, but that's not why it's purple. <laughs> it is purple because purple really signifies transformation. It signifies um, enlightenment and royalty, mm -hmm. right? And then the pinks and the lavenders really are about femininity and about grace and elegance, right? And so then in even each component that's inside of the box, everything is intentional and has a purpose. It's not just you know, ancillary things are thrown in there. Oh, this is cute. Let's throw that in there. It's not that everything in the box has a purpose and a story as to why it is in there. And all of it ties together with building self. And so there's also a workbook that goes with the program. And the workbook, ironically, mm -hmm. is called Grace. And so it's a definition of grace, but it's also an acronym about the activities that we do in the workbook. And that's around gratitude, around reflection, attitude, character, and esteem funny story that, you know, when I'm trying to come up with a, a name for the workbook and all of that, I had different names and then it, I landed on grace, right? It just came to me. Mm -hmm. And then again, like when it's happening, it's like, you don't connect the dots. You're like, okay, so I'm going to call it grace. And then the acronym of what the, the activities will be. And it wasn't until later on, I was like, oh my gosh, how many letters are there in grace? Yeah. <laughs> And that's how you spell it the whole time, right? Like, <laughs> but I had an aha moment later on, like, oh my gosh, sure. grace is five letters, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when I tell you like five shows up in my life, like so many places, it's like crazy. And it hasn't always, it, the five has probably always been there, but it wasn't until I had that encounter that I became cognizant of it and recognized it when it happens. Mm -hmm. Even the very first book that I wrote, which is um, bona fide bits for inspiration and intellect collide with your finances, right? And I said to my husband when I, when I was writing the book that I wanted it to have equal number. I didn't know what the number was, but equal number because it's broken down in what I call categories instead of chapters. So it's the categories of bona fide, educate, empower, evolve, enlighten, and enrich, right? And then they have like little pithies in each one and it'll have like an inspiration, and that inspiration could be a quote, something someone said. It could be off a bumper sticker. It could be a scripture. It can be off a billboard, but something profound or whatever. So it has this inspiration. And then it will give you a life application of that inspiration and a financial application of that inspiration. 
right? Mm. And so I said, I want the equal number in each of the five categories, right? And so if you've ever written a book, you know, you go through different iterations and all of that. And so I'm going through, you know, the different iterations, ready to go to print. So I sent it to print. And honestly, it did not dawn on me until the first copy of the book, of course, had to go to my heartbeat. So my husband's with his first copy of the book, hot off the press, and he's looking at the book or whatever. And how about we noticed that in each of the categories, there happens to be 11. Mm. And what's 11 times five? 55. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> drop the mic. Only God can do that. Like, it's just, it's wow. like blew my mind. Like, I knew I wanted equal numbers and I guess I counted, but it didn't click. You sure? Until yeah. later that there was 11 in each category and there's five categories. So it's 55. That's two, five. Like, it's the wow. five again. That's funny. Right? Wow. Double grace. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so it just, my life has just been crazy like that around this number five. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems and so like, when I was wow. 55, a couple of years ago, so I'm about to be 57. I deemed that my year of double grace. Oh, nice. I'm going to tell yeah. you so many powerful things happened in my life in mm. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. You started up this, the new, the whole new thing. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. That's amazing. It's just like so many things happen in mm. 2020. Wow. You know, Positive things, because of course we had COVID too. Right, right. right. But, but even that, it is, there's power in that horrific scenario, mm-hmm. right? It, it's all in you choosing the perspective that you want to see and take away from that. Um, mm-hmm. Because a lot of good things came out of that period of time, not COVID per se. We're not happy and excited about COVID. Right. But some of the things that happen as a result of are positive if you choose to find and see the positive in them. Definitely. Right? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's all about perspective. It's all about mindset. It's all about choices, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we get to choose how we see things. We get to choose how we feel about what we see, what we hear, what we read. And, and if you choose negative, you can find negative everywhere you go, everywhere you turn, you can find something negative about everything. The sun is shining. Oh, well, it's too hot, right? right. You can find right. something <laughs> negative to say about anything. But how about the same is true that you can find something positive to say about everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, so absolutely. It's all in your perspective. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. So you you mentioned a while back the outreach that you do, and it sounds like you do a lot of it within your business as well. Mm-hmm. And you do it with your husband as well. What are all the different outreaches that you, that you participate oh, wow. in? It's probably, it sounds like a lot. (laughs) um, It's a lot. And in fact, so much so, someone actually wrote a book about me. So my first book I I published in 2016. Then in 2019, someone wrote a book about me Mm. and my volunteerism. And then most recently in 2020, I also participated in an anthology. And my chapter in the anthology is called Bread is Bread is Bread. And so people always kind of look funny when I say that, like, what is it, you know? Um, (laughs) And most people want to, oh, but since I do finance, I think it's about money. Oh, And it's right. not directly, but indirectly. What my chapter is about is about perseverance. It's about not only dreaming, but dreaming big. I, I said earlier that there's other people that do what I do. There's other people that do what you do, right? You're not the only podcaster in the world. There's millions, right? right. But no yeah. one can do it like you, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so that is the messaging in the bread is bread is bread is that you go in any grocery store down the bread aisle. How many types of bread do you see? How many brands of bread do you see? You know, how many shapes of bread do you see? How many colors? Are, like, it's just endless, right? Mm-hmm. Something as common as bread, right? But suppose any one of those bakers said, oh, well, I'm not going to make bread because there's already, already someone making bread. Well, then the bread that's on the shelf may not be one that you like or one that you can't even eat. Maybe you have some food allergies or whatever, whatever. So you can't even eat that. So what? You don't get bread because this person decided not to make bread just because there was some kind of bread already there. Right. And Mm -hmm. so whatever it is that you desire to do to be, you dream, don't allow other things and circumstances and situations to deter you from that dream. It doesn't matter if there's 10 million other people that do what I do. No one can do it like me, but me, because I'm the only me there is, right? So there's something different about the way that I teach what I teach, even though, you know, money is green and everybody gets to spend it one time. And, you know, all those principles are true, 
And there's other people that tell you about how to spend it, but no one can do it or say it like me. And Mm -hmm. so there's a market for me. I'm not everybody's flavor, but nor is the next person everybody's flavor. Yeah. Right. Mm Because bread is bread is bread. You know, you might want wheat bread, but you want this specific brand of wheat bread kind of thing. And so if I hadn't accepted my assignment to do me, to be me, somebody won't be here today. Right. Serenity wouldn't be here today because I decided not to make bread. Right. And so don't allow anything to get in the way of your dreams and not only dream, but dream big because there's room for everybody. The book on outreach, we do partner with several nonprofits or what have you. We, we one that I serve with Blanket Tampa Bay we're, every Monday night here in Tampa, there's a, a church that allows us to use their parking lot and we partner with some other entities, but we feed, we clothe, we resource the homeless every Monday night. We brought in some partners that do coffee and all that humanizing them. Mm-hmm. And, and it is such a special feeling to do that. We, when COVID first hit, even through that partnership, I'm also served on one of the mayor or mayor's boards here. And when COVID hit and they said, everybody needs a shelter in place. Well, when you have a home and all that, like that made sense to you. But when you're homeless, what does that mean to you? Yeah, right. Where do they go? What what does shelter in place mean? Shelter under my bridge, under my box? Like, what does that really mean Mm -hmm. when you're homeless? And not only that, when we all were forced to shelter in place and things shut down, Where do they get the resources that they need to survive? Um, You can't go to the clinic to get your medication. You can't go over, you know, over here to get, you know, your food stamps or your bus pass. Like all those places were closed down. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, most people that you're thinking, oh, shelter. So literally, when I tell you put it together just like that, almost instantaneously in less than a week, we put together, we got some land. Some people refer to it as tent city. We call it Hillsboro Hope. And we had 100 tents put up. All the resources that the homeless need was brought to that location. And they lived there. That was their shelter in place with all the resources that they needed. And one of my community partners that owns a coffee company, again, just a heart to serve. And they came on board and we first were just going to serve them coffee. The first day they had coffee by day two. I kid you not, I have to send you the picture sometime. It was like a full on bistro. Wow. With the chalkboard, with the, you know, we were serving cappuccinos <laughs> and lattes and hot, everything you could get at Starbucks, we were serving there. Oh, that's great. Wow. For the homeless. Mm-hmm. Top shelf coffee for the homeless. It, it is just beyond words even to describe what that made them feel like. Mm-hmm. You know, in spite of your situation and life has beat you down and you're at your lowest. But this cup of coffee in this moment, you're like anybody else standing at a Starbucks drinking a cup of coffee in their $10,000 suit, red bottom shoes or whatever. You are that person Mm -hmm. in this moment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You you know, they found their value. They found self-worth in a cup of coffee crazy. We were there. We would open up, start serving coffee at 4 a.m., which means we were there like four something every morning for over 40 days straight. Oh, wow. Yeah. To serve the homeless. I mean, his grace, his grace. And the craziest thing about it that I share now, you know, COVID, no one knew what COVID was, what it really does, all that kind of stuff, you know, how you transmit it, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, we were wearing the mask and the gloves and, and all of that prayed every morning before we started, all of that kind of thing. And I tell you, to this day, I've never had COVID. Mm, Yeah. Over 40 days straight down there in the throes, homeless. So they're not bathing. And, you know, when they got there, they were able, because we had showers, everything. This was a better life than they had before, Mm. right? Because now you've got a tent, which is a roof over your head. You got a place you can shower and change your clothes. You got a place you can do laundry. You're eating every day. You know, if you need medical attention, medical people are brought here to you. Everything was there Mm -hmm. for them to to hear them tell their stories. On Mother's Day, a chef came in from Miami. Oh, wow. To fix them breakfast, Mm. making them feel like people. Yeah. Right. Seeing beyond their circumstance, because the reality is there before the grace of God, right? Because if you ever have conversation with some of these people, 
You understand? They were just like you and me. They had houses and cars and clothes and family and jobs and all of that. But life, whatever that is, whether it is you lost your job and then you, things started to spiral, whether mm-hmm. you lost your medical insurance. And so the medication you needed to be on to keep you balanced, you're no longer on. You know, life, yeah. what, whatever it is, yeah. something happened. And now this is your circumstance, right? And so all they really want, just like the kids, see me. Don't see yeah. through me, around me, under me. See me. I'm a human. Even though I haven't bathed in a week, I'm a human being. I have a heart. If you cut me, I'm going to bleed red blood, right? Mm-hmm. You say something wrong, it's going to hurt my feelings, mm-hmm. right? Human. And they just want people to see them as that. So that's probably one of one of the powerful situations. Um, I do, you know, kids, educational stuff, volunteer in the detention center. I think I mentioned okay. that before. Yeah, right. These kids... Their life is broken. They're broken. The system's broken. Everything is broken around them. I don't know how they get fixed, right? It's just life. But to be there to help, to pour in, to just show them that someone cares is going to allow them to hold on another day. And each day that you hold on is another opportunity for something to change. Just a lot, you know, clothing, you know, I do partner with and provide clothing to the homeless. So various entities provide me clothing for me to distribute. Mm through them, you know, whether it's Dress for Success is one of my partners. I have a lot of community partners with different things. And I tell you, people, a lot of people, I will say, but a lot of people have a good heart and a heart to serve. They don't know how to serve, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know what to do. And they may not even want to be on the front line, but they want to help. And so they do their part, you know, and everybody has a part. So I have a couple, even a couple of Dollar Trees that are my community partners and Mm -hmm. they give me food. The, the individually wrapped whatever, whether it's donuts or cookies or crackers or whatever, they give that stuff to me mm. so that I can distribute it to those in need, right? So everybody, it's just all it takes is a heart. The rest will figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a heart to serve, he will create a way, a path for you to do that. And it takes all kinds of people and all kinds of help to make the system work. The manager, the doc, maybe they can't come down but they can provide the food for somebody else to take down. Right. Mm -hmm, And so their part is no less important because they weren't on the front line. Being Mm -hmm. on the front line is not everybody's thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you can't do that. Give us money. We'll go buy the stuff to take it, you know, whatever your part, but it all starts with the heart, right? If you got a heart to serve, there's opportunity. Yeah. So my list, my laundry list is long. So I'll send that to you if you want to see it. Like, Yeah. yeah. It's hard work. And when you're doing it, it doesn't feel like work. And, and yeah. when you get that smile or that hug, I don't care how tired you are. It is that moment. That you, this is why I do what I do for just that 10 seconds of seeing that person smile or, or, or hearing their genuine thank you and appreciation for the little things. Because I remember the first time, the very first time we went down to serve the homeless, you know, was my team that I put together is my husband, some some folks from our church, some people that we know, some of our friends, and we call it our Keep Tampa Warm team. And it only we only have to activate a couple times a year because it's when our temperature gets below 40, right? So it's only oh, a couple sure. times a year. Oh, that's right. I didn't think about that. But yeah. I call my team, you know, we've got somebody that gets us blankets and all of that. We activate our convoy and we literally go down to the area. It's like a bridge area where most of the homeless congregate mm-hmm. when it's cold. The very first time we went down there, We just had the blankets and stuff and they were grateful. But the next night, you know, they asked us when we pulled, do you have something hot to drink? Mm. And of course, I wasn't even thinking. I'm thinking blankets and clothing. And I was on a mission because the next night it was going to be going to be cold again that Saturday. And I had two days and I went, I got a coffee container. It's like five gallon hot container cooler thing. And I was determined to find coffee. And I kid you not, when I tell you, just have a heart. He'll do the rest. I stopped at one McDonald's and long story short, they were like, as it turns out, the owner of that McDonald's owned another, in a five mile triangle radius. He owned two and his brother-in-law owned the other one. Oh, <laughs> go figure. Look uh-huh. at God. Mm. And every time I would need coffee, stop by, leave my container. They provided everything. Wow. That's right? great. A heart wow. to serve. It's all it was <laughs> a heart. And my heart connected with their heart, right? They got the coffee. I got the container. Like, boom, come together. When we pulled up that night with the coffee. The first guy that walks up to us, he said, oh, my gosh. He said, I was just saying to, I guess it's his wife. He said, it's going to be so cold tonight. What are we going to do? And then you guys showed up with blankets. Hmm. Like 
right, right at the end of his sentence is when we pulled up and we had blankets. Oh, when I tell you wow. he was in tears, we were in tears. We all were crying. But that's oh. his grace. You put that in the universe. He mm-hmm. answered your prayer just like that. Mm-hmm. That's how amazing he can be, right? Heart work, heart work. Just because wow. I didn't know he, just, you know, we didn't know he had just said that, right? It's sure. Just yeah. Like how he orchestrated the timing. He was like, he was in tears. And then you guys showed up with blankets. <laughs> it's like, wow, yeah. just drop the yeah. mic. Like, you know, it, it's yeah. just, it's those moments like that. Or when we've served homeless and someone in the crowd will say, can I sing for you? Mm. This is all I have to offer, right? Mm. And when I tell you they can blow, as old people said, they can sing, like they can really, really yeah. sing, <laughs> right? Either homeless or so people can't even see that gift because they're so taken right. aback by the package. And mm-hmm. when I tell you they blow, just like, oh my gosh, like, wow. Yeah. Right? yeah. But that's their gift. Or when I was working with these youth, this is just over Valentine's Day. And this kid, I when I after I finished working with them, I always bring them goodies or what have you. And the kid came up to me and he had, what do they call it? Jolly Ranchers mm-hmm. and said, Miss Pam, this is all I have, but I want you to have it. He gave me a Jolly Rancher. Aww. When I tell you, I cried like a baby. It was like, oh my God, that's, that's so all sweet. he had yeah. to give, mm-hmm. but he wanted me to have it. Mm. Oh my God. You know, <laughs> it's those moments. Yeah. That's beautiful. That you know, you've mm-hmm. had impact. Mm -hmm. it's a big deal wow that's incredible (gasps) yeah (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) I almost did it I almost finished and I didn't even cry (laughs) I know (laughs) yeah that's what's important Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. good stuff yeah what do you think what or who do you think has been a big influence on you as far as either this work in outreach or through your, when you were growing up or through your career to get you to this point? I would have to say my parents. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. both of them were givers. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, we were the house where the kids wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Right. And we, we right. had rules at our house, you know, sure. my dad yeah. would be the first one to say when you say, Oh, well, my friends, are, I don't care what your friends doing now. This is a lofting household. And this is how we're going to do it in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like put down the, put his foot down. I don't really care. These are our rules kind of thing. Sure. But in spite of rules and getting some no's and all of that, the other kids could feel the difference, right? Mm. This was the house where the kids wanted to be even with the rules. Right. Yeah. So if you spend the night, if you're here, you're following these rules. If you're at the dinner table, these are your rules. I don't know what you do at your house. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we do. <laughs> right. Um, but even with that, like they wanted to be there. You know, yeah. my parents, like yeah. I said, they were always givers. And and it's not like they sit us down and say, OK, we're going to be givers. Right. It's just because kids are sponges. They are observing and watching how you how you move in life. Mm-hmm. Right. How you treat people. I know what you said to do, but I'm watching how you did do. Yes. Yeah. Right. And 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 so in seeing that, it just is. It wasn't even, I don't think, like a conscious choice like this. Oh, I want to do outreach. I want to serve. It's right. just I was drawn to serve. It just organically kind of happened. I was blessed to hook up with someone who has a heart to serve. Yeah. Right. And Mm -hmm. so it's not even, oh, honey, I'll be back. I'm going to do this. Right. We're there together kind of thing, which is nice. Right. That's like icing on my cake is that this person that I've connected with, you know, has that heart to serve, to give, to do. And and it's just nice to be there side by side with my husband, you you know, tackling Mm -hmm. the world kind of thing in so many aspects of my life. It's just nice. Um, to, yeah. to have that. And so that's why I guess I refer to it as like my heartbeat because it's kind of like we're in this rhythm. And um, so it's nice. That it's sounds nice. very nice. Yes. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. You are welcome. And you have, you have kids of your own. Is that right? How many kids do you have, have? Four boys and nine grandchildren and now a great grandson. Wow. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Yeah, Wonderful. so he's just born in September. So he's still a little guy. It, it's, and, and I tell people, like, you know, COVID kept us from Christmas. Our, our tradition is all of our three of our boys 
and all of the grandkids and now the great grandson, they're all in San Antonio, Texas, which was my husband's last duty station, which was nice. Right. Oh, OK. Yeah. And so it's been our tradition that we go to San Antonio for Christmas, of course, so we can be with our grandkids. And so for two years, of course, no Christmas in San Antonio because of mm. COVID. So this mm-hmm. past Christmas, of course, we're on and popping. So we get back to San Antonio, back to our tradition. And, and I've said so many times that I really wish I had had the, the, the mindset to, to hit the record button. There were moments when we were at one of our son's house, the other boys and the grandkids were there. And me and my daughter-in-law were sitting on the sofa and I said, the house was so loud <laughs> with love and joy mm. and laughter and banter. And just, it was such a beautiful thing. And, and I said, that was Christmas for me. Mm-hmm. That was the best gift ever was the house being so loud. Mm. You know, yeah. just I mean, the little ones running around and giggling and, you know, playing games and just it was just magic. It yeah. was just magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it just, you know, some people might think Christmas material. That for me, that noise. And I wish I had recorded it so I could play it yeah. over and over. But when <laughs> I think about it, I get the same emotion. So I guess it's in my head playing. On this Definitely. endless loop, it just, that was Christmas in those moments when the house was so loud. Mm. It was Christmas. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. And after having to miss it a couple times. Yes. Yes. Because virtual is good, but it's not the same. No, not you know, at all. Yeah. Nini can't get a hug over the computer. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I need my Nini hugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's important. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, that's sweet. Uh, well, so is there anything else that you would like to share? Anything anywhere you want to make sure folks can find you or anything else about your business? Well, thank you. Yes, I'd love for all of your listeners to reach out to me via my website. It's probably the easiest because then it would have all the other stuff. It'll have my social media links. It'll have my phone number. It'll have my email. And Perfect. that is PamelaMcCoy.com but they have to make sure that Pamela with three A's. So it's P-A-M-A-L-A, no E, PamelaMcCoy.com. And they can find information on the bona fide side of my business, which is the financial capability, education, personal money management stuff. They can find stuff on the B5 Reaffirm side of my business, which is focusing solely on the self-esteem of females. In the shop, they can find branded products for both brands, for the bona fide, as well as the B5 Reaffirm. They can find branded products, as well as the B5 reaffirmation box and workbook can be purchased via the website. And then certainly if there's any organization or entity that would love either one of the programs or hybrid of the finance and the self-esteem, please reach out. There's a contact form on the website as well. Would love to connect with anyone and everyone for impact collaboration, you know, organizations, if you want to collaborate, I'm open to that as well. Oh, that sounds great. Wonderful. Yeah. And we will include all that info in our show notes as well. So people can click through as well. And awesome. yeah, is there anything else, anything I missed? I always afterwards, I'm like, oh, I should have asked this question or <laughs> this or that. Um, I don't know. I think we've hit on a lot of things. I, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity. So thank you for, you know, allowing me to be a guest on your show um, and to share with you, with your audience and, and all of that. And uh, yeah, just thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for joining me. I I have enjoyed hearing your story and excited to share it with folks. And thanks for connecting with me today. You are welcome. You are welcome. Thank you for joining us for Take Notice, Amplifying Black Stories. Connect with us on social media. We are at Take Notice Podcast. You can also find us at www.takenoticepodcast.org. And if you're interested in being a guest, please reach out. You can email us at takenoticepodcast at gmail.com. Take Notice Amplifying Black Stories is produced, hosted, and edited by Allison Preisinger Higgins. Music by Version Big Five featuring Darius Higgins. Thank you for being with us and thank you for taking notice. Thank you.